in 6.1, talking about scale diagrams and enlargement. So in this unit, we're going to learn about large things and shrink things, so making large and reductions. So in order to make scale diagrams, you need to make things in equal proportions. So if you take a look, has anybody ever skipped a rock in a water? Okay. Do you notice that when the rock actually hits the water, it's going to make those circles that come outwards? Okay. Well, th those are basically actually scale diagrams of the original. Though they are enlarging what that original little plop in the water became. Okay. So that's an example in real life of an enlargement. Let's take a look here. We've got an, ex uh, an equation here that we always use. Okay. So we've got d divided by a is equal to s. What the heck does that mean? Well, first of all, the D on the top is always the diagram meaning on paper. What you draw on paper and what you write, okay? The A on the bottom is the actual real life, real answer size, okay? So if you have a jet airplane and you want to draw a scale diagram of it, then you have your jet airplane number is going to be on the bottom. And then the top one, the diagram is going to be the top what you would draw, okay? The S is equal to the scale diagram. How much did it grow or shrink by? Okay, if you look at a map, any map, that's the scale on the very bottom of it. And that scale is telling you how many kilometers each little centimeter or each little millimeter on that map is in real life. Okay, so we use scales for everything. So, we can also rearrange this equation using algebra, of course. So if we rearrange this equation, we can actually put it into a triangle. So here's my triangle, and I can put... D on the top, and I have S on the bottom and A on the bottom. What that means, if you think of this top line here as a divide line, and this dotted line as a multiply sign, if I ever want to try and find an answer, you, you solve for the other one. So you cover one of them up. So if I want to solve for scale factor, I cover him up, what am I have to do? I take the D and divide by A. If I want to solve for A, I cover it up. I take D and divide by S. Over here, if I want to solve for the D, I take S and I times it by A, and that's all these equations are rearranged, okay? You'll see a lot of that in science. Did you work with that in science and stuff like that? Good. All right. So it says, scale factors of enlargement mean that this S number is going to be a number that's bigger than 1, okay? If it's equal to 1, nothing happened to the object. It stayed the same. If it goes 1 point something or a fraction with a number that's bigger on the top, then you're going to have an enlargement. It got bigger. Okay. So if you have a number like 1.2 or 9 over 6, okay, the top number's bigger and the decimal's bigger than 1, that means it's growing bigger. Okay. So it says the units are always in the diagram D and A. They must be the same in order to compare them. So in real life, we have uh, things we talk about in terms of meters and in distance, we talk kilometers, okay? But on paper, when we draw them, we're only talking centimeters because we don't have much paper room to draw on, okay? So we have to convert all of our units, typically always, to centimeters, okay? So that's going to be a really big key here on this unit. So let's take a look and see what the scale factor rule tells us here. It tells us that it's always written as a fraction. So with, because it's written as a fraction, we need to reduce the fraction. Okay, always simplest form is your final answer. Now, if the question asks for decimal form and the fraction is a run-on decimal or repeating decimal, okay, run-on or repeating, you leave it as a fraction even though the question asks you for, for the decimal form. Okay, so if you have a run-on decimal that doesn't end and if you have a, a repeating decimal, of course, that will never end, you always leave it in fraction form if it asks for decimal form, unless it asks, it tells you specifically how to round that decimal. If it says round to three decimal places, then you can. If it doesn't tell you how to round and your decimals are running on forever, leave it as a fraction. Okay, that's your rule. So, if I've got a small number on top of a big number, we just discussed this, okay? So that means this would be my D on top. What number's in the bottom? That A is in the bottom, okay? So we've got a D and an A. That is equal to our what? Our S, our scale factor. Okay. If I have a small number on top and a bigger one on the bottom, what's happened to that object, do you think? 
it's shrinking. It's getting smaller. So this guy's actually shrinking, which means it's called a reduction. And if you've got a big number, it's the opposite. The big number on top is going to be a, it's going to grow. Okay, the object is growing. So that means it is a enlargement. Okay, so things shrink and grow, meaning reducing and enlarging. Let's take a look at a couple examples here. If I've got the number, um, let's go four over five. What happened to that object? It shrunk. Good. This one is a shrink. Okay, that object shrunk. Now, how much did it shrink by? How do you find it out? Take the top number and divide by the bottom. That's how you know how much it shrunk by. So it shrank by four fifths, but how much did it actually shrink by? 0 0.8, good. Okay, let's take another one. Let's reverse that. Let's go five over four. Okay, now I've got a bigger number on top. What do you think is gonna happen here then? It's gonna grow, good. So it's gonna enlarge. It's gonna enlarge or grow. So how much did it grow by? Right, 1.25. Okay, grew by 1.25 times. Did you go there? Okay, let's move on to the next section. <clears throat> when we shrink or grow an object, if we're asked to draw it, the new drawing is called a new image. It's called the image figure. Now, because it's called a new image, it needs to be labeled properly. It needs to be labeled differently than the first one. So if you take a look here, my original object is W, X, and Y. That's my original object there. And each of those other objects have grown by a little bit. So what do you notice I've done to the letters? What have I done? Well, it looks like an exponent. They're actually called prime ticks, okay? You put prime ticks, and really it's kind of like the, the letter I, okay? Meaning image one. If there's a double I, image two. A triple I, image three, okay? So that's how you know how much the object's done and grown by. And that's how you also know which object went first, okay? So if it's got a map of a whole bunch of things that happened to a certain object and you don't know what happened to it, look at these prime ticks. It'll tell you what happened. The one said this happened first. This happened second with the two, okay? And then if there's one with the three, it happened last, all right? So this is what's actually happening. Whoopsie. Let's pull that out. There we go. So, when you enlarge or shrink an object, the new objects created and drawn must be labeled. Okay, you've got to be labeling. The new objects must be labeled. Yes, you do need to copy this, please. In order to label those new points, you've got to give them a new name. And the new name has to have a prime tick. It's like a little baby eye. It's like an exponent, but it's like a little baby eye. I'll give you a minute to write that. Remember, it also tells you the order. Here we talked about it says the ticks tell you the order of the changes or transformations whenever we're talking about objects that are changing and they're growing or they're changing size that means they're transforming into something okay so when they transform or change the order of them it tells you by what the digits are is it a dot an i or a double i or triple i again you see one of them 
it happened first. If you see two of them, it happened second. Okay, that's how you know what happened. Here's our first example. So we're talking about enlargement. What happened to our diagram? We want to have each diagram enlarged by two. If they're enlarging by two, what do you think I have to do to that those uh, diagrams? Draw more that are what? Same size? No. No. You want to double it. Good. So it says, it tells you what to do. It says multiply each length by two. So that means we have to count the lengths of our objects. So I need to label them here. I know this guy's going to be a four and this is a two. This guy is a two by two. <clears throat> now what I have to do is I have to multiply each of those numbers by two. And that's what I draw the next time. So if I multiply both of these numbers by two, I'm going to get eight and four. So now I draw eight and four. So I'm going to draw eight going down. And then I'm going to go four going across and then back up. And then you label it properly. So we don't have any letters here, but we can just label our numbers. So this is going to be eight and that's going to be four. Okay. The other one is two by two. If I double those, what size do they become? Four by four. Four by four, excellent. So we're going to draw a little four by four up here and you can overlap things, it's totally fine. There's my four by four. <clears throat> now we can also do this by cross multiplying and dividing with our equation. And that's what we're going to do. Make sure you're following along and drawing all of the stuff here, please. Okay, it's telling us here that we can also enlarge them by using our equation. So the diagram we had on paper was a four by two and two by two. The scale factor was a what? A two. So I need to find this number, didn't I? Well, I can cross multiply and divide. What do we have to do to S if we ever don't know if it's a fraction? What do we make? How do we make anything a fraction? Put a one under it. Good. So that's how we can do these. And we can do side A and side B that exact same way. So let's write our ratios down, please. We're looking for the diagram, our new diagram length for each of those sides. Okay, this is for our large rectangle. This is for our rectangle that was a two by four. This is our two by four rectangle. So if we take side A as our long side, this is side A, and we're saying this is side B, we would set it up as D over A equals S over one. Okay, and then we just cross multiply and divide. Now, when you're cross multiplying and dividing, how do you know which digits to multiply? Good, the ones that are diagonally across from each other. Do they have to be in a certain order? No, they always have to be diagonally across from each other. After that, you just divide by the number left over. It doesn't matter which number it is, okay, as long as it's the one that hasn't been multiplied. So over here, I'm going to multiply those two and divide by the number left over. Well, dividing by one, does that change my answer? No, so all I'm going to do is multiply these guys. I'm going to get eight. Is that what I got the first time when I just doubled them? Yes. Over here, two times two gives me four. Divided by one, does it change it? No. So I found my new dimensions, eight and four. Okay? So you can do it by just drawing the object doubly bigger on the page. But if they don't give you an object on a sheet and they don't show you a diagram, how do you do it with just the numbers? So this is how you do it with just the numbers. Yes? And that's what we're doing here. We're doing S times A and then dividing what's underneath it was just a one. But S times A works. Because remember, we rearranged our equation, right? With D, S, and A. So D is just S times A. Okay? Which is basically what we're doing when we cross multiply it. Okay? All right. The reason we do it this way, though, is because what if S is a fraction? If S is a fraction with a different number of other than one underneath it, we have to know how to do this process. Okay? That's why it's super important. So let's take an example like that. Let's try an example. Let's say that we wanted to increase that by 5 over 2. By 5 over 2, which is 2.5 times. Okay, we want to increase it by 5 over 2. So if I increase this guy by 5 over 2, that means I'm going to have D over 4 equals 5 over 2. 
Okay, that would be my scale factor if I've got my scale factor is 502. Okay, this is just an extension example from this. Please write this down, okay? Because it's going to show you the difference on how it works if your scale factor is a fraction with a different number other than 1 on the bottom. Okay, because it is different. So now this time, it is important. We can't just go at, um, D or S times A. If I go S times A, that's all of this. I have to multiply all of that. Well, yes, I can. But when you do that, you're going to have to take 5 divided by 2 first, then times it by your 4. If we cross multiply and divide, it makes it a bit easier. So all we have to do again is multiply the ones that are diagonal and then divide by the number left over. Okay, the number left over can be a top number as long as it's a number left over. Yes? Uh, sorry, where did you get the 4? We're still using this example from our original rectangle right here, this one. Oh. Okay, that's where I got the 4. Okay, let's move on to the next example. We've got this guy, and it says we want to increase it. Look what we have, a 5 over 2. Okay, so again, this is our 4 by 2, and now 5 over 2, which means we have to take 4 over, or sorry, t over 4, equals 5 over 2, and then we've got d over 2 equals 5 over 2. And again, we multiply and divide with, by what's left over, multiply and divide by what's left over. And that's how we're going to find out what our new object's going to look like. Okay? Or we can just take our new number here and times it by 6, or 2.5. How do I know it's 2.5? Well, I can just divide that guy and get a decimal. Remember, if it's a terminating decimal, you can use it. It's fine. But if it's a run-on decimal, you have to leave it in the fraction form, and you must do it this way with the cross multiply and divide if it's a run-on decimal or a repeating decimal. Okay? So if you use the number two-thirds, that's a repeating decimal. You would have to use the cross multiply and divide. Okay? So let's take our numbers here. 5 times 4 is 20. Divided by 2 is... 10. So our big number is going to be 10. There's 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. There's 10. Okay, let's find our next side. 2 times 5 is 10. Divided by 2 is 5. Good. So this guy's going to be 5. This guy equals 10. So let's draw 5 over. And then we'll go back up. Okay, so we have our 10 by 5. Any questions so far? No, we're pretty good? Okay, last couple questions. These questions we've been solving for the new diagram length. We already have our scale factor. Now we're going to work backwards. We're going to have both objects, and we need to know how much it grew by. So we need to now find the scale factor part. So here's our next example. And it tells us, it says, solve the scale factor, use the same side lengths from each shape. That's super important. I can't compare a long side to a short side. Okay, you've got to compare the same sides. For example, you're going to use a small, shorter side on each triangle and compare them and use those numbers together. Okay, and then you compare the longer side and use those numbers together. The diagonal one, you're not going to use the diagonal one because it's cutting through parts of, of squares. In order to find out the diagonal one, it's going to be based off of what we find here with our uh, vertical and horizontal shape lines. Okay, so what size is this guy over here, the A to B? These two, what's B to C? Four, good. What do we have on the very bottom here? There's three, there's, three, there's six. What do we have on the side here? Three. Okay. So if we call this, he's labeled already, so that means he's our actual real life. Okay, he's what we start with. Your actual real life, in this case, is what we're starting with. And we're making it grow bigger. So this is our diagram. Okay, our actual and our diagram. So now I need to set up my equation. So I've got S is equal to D over A. And now I need to put my numbers in to find out what S is. And I have to check both sides because both sides have to match. If both sides don't have the same scale factor, then this object right here is not a scale factor of the other guy. Okay? Here it's telling us that it is, 
but we have to make sure that it is, okay? So we're going to match the tall ones, A to B. So I'm going to have my, my actual is a 2. My top number is a 3. What do I get when I take 3 divided by 2? 1.5, perfect. So this guy's scale factor is 1.5 for this short side. Now I'm going to find that squiggly line, that long side, okay, the longer leg. Again, I'm going to set my scale factor up like this. S equals D over A. This time I know my A is 4. Then my D is 6. If I take 6 divided by 4, what do I get? 1.5. They match. You want them to match, which means that they are scale factors of each other. So these guys match, which means they are equal. Okay? So if they're matching and they're equal, that means that, yes, this guy is a scale factor of this one. Okay? And now it tells us we still have to label it properly. Did I label those corners and vertices? Those corners are called vertices, those points. Did I label them? No, they're blank. I need to label them. So I take the letters from this triangle here. I've got A, B, and C, and I match them over here. So I'm going to have A here, B here, and C here. Now I've got to draw my little prime ticks on me. Is this a one change? How many changes have I made? Just one. It's my new image. So I put little prime tick ones on the top right. Okay? And that tells me that it's a new image, only changed once. Okay? Any questions so far? No? Okay, let's take a look at diagonal lines. How do we deal with doing this exact same thing when we've got diagonal lines? So when we take a look here, we've got diagonal lines. Now this one's telling us, we've got trapezoids here. It's saying to solve to the scale factor, again, we've got to use the same sides. So I've got to compare the top side to the top side. But what do you notice about the top side of the short one? It doesn't go all the way. It doesn't go all the way. So I don't really know how far it is. Is it one and a half? Is it half? This guy I know for sure is a three. Okay, I know that for sure. I know the bottom of this big guy is how big? Five. How, long, how big is the bottom of this one? Two. Two, good. All right. Now it's giving us a hint. It says, how do we scale for the, fall, uh, for the scale factor if there's diagonal oblique lines? It's giving us a hint. What's it telling us? You can do it two different ways. To find this vertical diagonal line, that was contradictory. This diagonal line, we can find it by drawing a vertical line down the middle. If I draw a vertical line down the middle, that's going to tell me how long this line here should be in proportion. Not exactly, but in proportion. So one way of doing it is to draw a line down the middle and counting how many squares that is. Okay? That's one way to do it. So this guy would give me a three. This guy here gives me one, two, three, four. Gives me nine. Okay? Now, I could also do it another way. What's the other way it's telling me to do it? By doing what? Draw a rectangle around it. Good. So I could draw a rectangle around this guy and then now find this, this long side. Well, what do you know? It's the same as what I drew in the middle. It's three. Same thing over here. I could make a rectangle around the outside and now count this side here. And what do you know? It's not the same thing as my middle line. Okay, so both strategies work, whichever you prefer to do. So now I'm going to compare both those numbers and see what happens here. So again, this is my actual object. This is my diagram object because it grew. So I set up my equation. S equals D over A. And I put the numbers in. But remember, you've got to compare the same sides. So you can't compare the small horizontal bottom to the vertical. You cannot. They're not the same. So we're going to compare our small bottom ones. So the bottom is my actual is a 2, my diagram is a 5. If I divide those out, what do I get? What do I get for that? 2.5. Good. So for the small legs, it's a 2.5. Okay, for the small short sides. 
Let's find the long side, the diagonals, the one in the middle. So the guy in the middle here is a 9, and over here I've got a 3. So I'm going to say S equals D over A, and I'm going to have 9 over 3. Well, that's going to give me a 3. Do these guys match? No, they don't match. So if they don't match, what do I know? They're not a scale factor of each other. You've got to check both parts. Okay? So these do not match. Okay, the scale factors do not match, <coughs> so it's not an enlargement. What could make that an enlargement? What could make that an enlargement? What numbers would I have to have to make that an enlargement? I would need this equation here to equal 2.5, okay? So that's what I would need. And if I use my, my small angle, my small one has a 3. So I would have this. I would have 3 on the bottom. I don't know D, but I know I'm going to have 2.5. So how would I find out what that D is going to be? What do I do to find D? Uh, multiply three by three. Good. Multiply these guys, right? Because D is equal to A times S. Okay. So if you multiply those two, what do you get? What's 2.5 times 3? 7.5, good. That equals 7.5. That means this line up here should be 7.5 for these to match. And it's not, it's too tall, it's a 9. Okay, so do you see how, the, how that should work? And why it doesn't in this case. Okay, all right. This is the end of lesson one of enlargements.